Questioning in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. One. You hear a man talking about a teacher. What did the teacher encourage him to do? A. To read more widely. B. To do some acting. C. To travel abroad. When I was in my last year of secondary school, in came Miss Gray, our new literature teacher. She really made us love the subject. She'd been a teacher in Africa and in India, and she'd tell us about her classes there. Fascinating. I was thinking at the time of joining the school theatre group, but needed someone to say, "Come on, you'll be good. Go for it." And that's what she did. She knew I loved reading plays, unlike some of my classmates. And I didn't need to be persuaded to read more, but she also knew that I was afraid of new challenges, and she helped me get over that. When I was in my last year of secondary school, in came Miss Gray, our new literature teacher. She really made us love the subject. She'd been a teacher in Africa and in India, and she'd tell us about her classes there. Fascinating. I was thinking at the time of joining the school theatre group, but needed someone to say, "Come on, you'll be good. Go for it." And that's what she did. She knew I loved reading plays, unlike some of my classmates. And I didn't need to be persuaded to read more, but she also knew that I was afraid of new challenges, and she helped me get over that. Two, you overhear a woman talking on the phone about her computer. Why is she complaining? A, the computer hasn't been repaired properly. B, a promise hasn't been kept. C, the computer hasn't been returned on time. You are the manager, aren't you? Well, all right. If he's out, look, your repair department took my computer away for repair yesterday. No, I don't know, but it was serious, and the point is, I would like a temporary replacement. But it distinctly says here in your brochure, in writing, that you lend one to customers if you have to take theirs away. No, well, I simply can't do without it for more than a couple of days. Your workshop said it would be repaired next Wednesday, though I begin to wonder. Well, in that case, why do you promise it? And better to say nothing. You are the manager, aren't you? Well, all right, if he's out. Look. Your repair department took my computer away for repair yesterday. No, I don't know, but it was serious, and the point is, I would like a temporary replacement. But it distinctly says here in your brochure, in writing, that you lend one to customers if you have to take theirs away. No, well, I simply can't do without it for more than a couple of days. Your workshop said it would be repaired next Wednesday, though I begin to wonder. Well, in that case, why do you promise it? And better to say nothing. Three, you hear two friends talking about a new sports centre. What's the man's opinion of it? A, it offers value for money. B, it's conveniently located. C, it provides opportunities for socialising. David, long time no see. What are you doing in this part of town? Melanie, great. Yeah, of course you live round here, don't you? <laughs> I've just been to the new sports centre down the road. I've started going there twice a week. Yeah, it looks really good, but I don't think I could afford it. Well, you can get a year's membership, and that only works out at about five pounds a week. And you can go as often as you want. They have lots of sports and a fantastic gym, and the staff are really friendly. Come along, it's a great place. David, long time no see. What are you doing in this part of town? Melanie, great. Yeah, of course you live round here, don't you? <laughs> I've just been to the new sports centre down the road. I've started going there twice a week. Yeah, it looks really good, but I don't think I could afford it. Well, you can get a year's membership, and that only works out at about five pounds a week. And you can go as often as you want. They have lots of sports and a fantastic gym, and the staff are really friendly. 
Come along, it's a great place. 4. You overhear a woman and a man talking at a railway station. What does the woman want to do? A. Change her travel arrangements. B. Find out appropriate information. C. Complain about the trip. So then I've got to get to Exeter by four in the afternoon. Is the best thing to take the ten o'clock train from here? Well, you could. It's a through train. You wouldn't have to change. But there are other possibilities if you were prepared to change. Then you could leave later. You mean change at Swindon? Oh, I got held up there last time. I was late for an appointment. I don't want that to happen again. Then the ten o'clock is your best bet. You'd have plenty of time spare, and there's a restaurant on that train too. Mm. So then I've got to get to Exeter by four in the afternoon. Is the best thing to take the ten o'clock train from here? Well, you could. It's a through train. You wouldn't have to change. But there are other possibilities if you were prepared to change. Then you could leave later. You mean change at Swindon? Oh, I got held up there last time. I was late for an appointment. I don't want that to happen again. Then the ten o'clock is your best bet. You'd have plenty of time spare, and there's a restaurant on that train too. Mm. 5. You hear part of a lecture on the radio. What is the lecturer doing? A. Supporting an existing theory. B. Putting forward a theory of his own. C. Arguing against other scientists' theories. It's often said that prehistoric humans mastered language long before they invented music. But scientists now believe that even our most distant ancestors may have been able to sing. Indeed, it could be that singing came before language rather than the other way round. The earliest form of human sound, they suggest, could have been a type of singing intended to express people's emotions rather than to pass on information. My research goes one step further, however, because I suspect that some of the earliest stone tools and weapons that have been discovered could actually have been primitive musical instruments, although this is something which I found very difficult to prove. It's often said that prehistoric humans mastered language long before they invented music. But scientists now believe that even our most distant ancestors may have been able to sing. Indeed, it could be that singing came before language rather than the other way round. The earliest form of human sound, they suggest, could have been a type of singing intended to express people's emotions rather than to pass on information. My research goes one step further, however, because I suspect that some of the earliest stone tools and weapons that have been discovered could actually have been primitive musical instruments, although this is something which I found very difficult to prove. 6. You overhear a woman telling a friend about something she attended recently at her local college. What is she describing? A. A concert. B. A lesson. C. A talk. I thought it was a great success. He hadn't done it in front of people before, except to his students, so it was important it went well. Some people complained afterwards because they said they couldn't hear what he said between each piece, but others said that didn't matter. They were really impressed by the fact they were all his own compositions, and the quality of the sound was superb, especially on the high notes and they did get a chance to go up and ask him questions at the end if they wanted. I thought it was a great success. He hadn't done it in front of people before, except to his students, so it was important it went well. Some people complained afterwards because they said they couldn't hear what he said between each piece, but others said that didn't matter. They were really impressed by the fact they were all his own compositions, and the quality of the sound was superb, especially on the high notes and they did get a chance to go up and ask him questions at the end if they wanted. 7. You overhear a man and a woman who used to study at the same school talking together. In the man's opinion, what was the woman like at school? A. Forgetful. B. Lazy. C. Untidy. It's hard to believe how people can change as they get older. Mm. Look at you. You're a business executive now. 
Responsible for a large department? Yes. Remember what I was like at school? Always in trouble for being lazy and leaving everything to the last minute. You weren't really lazy. You just didn't work more than absolutely necessary. <laughs> but you were messy. You drove everyone mad leaving stuff all over the place. And you seemed to be in a dream half the time, forgetting things. Mm. But I think you just pretended to be forgetful. That's true. It was convenient sometimes. And now you're a high flyer? It's hard to believe how people can change as they get older. Mm. Look at you. You're a business executive now. Responsible for a large department? Yes. Remember what I was like at school? Always in trouble for being lazy and leaving everything to the last minute. You weren't really lazy. You just didn't work more than absolutely necessary. <laughs> but you were messy. <laughs> you drove everyone mad leaving stuff all over the place. And you seemed to be in a dream half the time, forgetting things. Mm. But I think you just pretended to be forgetful. That's true. It was convenient sometimes. And now you're a high flyer? Eight. You hear a tennis player talking about how he hurt himself. What does he think caused his injury? A. Lifting something before a game. B. Failing to prepare himself for a game. C. Playing a difficult shot during a game. Well, I got to the gate at the back of the sports centre in Percy Street. It was locked, but I managed to get my bike over the fence. And that's when it must have happened. <laughs> Stupid, really, when you think about it. But I couldn't be bothered to cycle round to the main entrance. Anyway, I got changed and Jim was waiting on the court. I did my usual bit of warming up, stretching the leg muscles and so on. But the first ball I hit, well, that was it. I felt this shooting pain right down my arm and the racket just fell out of my hand. Well... I got to the gate at the back of the sports centre in Percy Street. It was locked, but I managed to get my bike over the fence. And that's when it must have happened. <laughs> Stupid, really, when you think about it. But I couldn't be bothered to cycle round to the main entrance. Anyway, I got changed and Jim was waiting on the court. I did my usual bit of warming up, stretching the leg muscles and so on. But the first ball I hit, well, that was it. I felt this shooting pain right down my arm and the racket just fell out of my hand. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a man called Jeremy Baker talking about different ways of travelling in northern Finland. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Jeremy, I know you've just come back from Finland and you had some interesting experiences with transport while you were there, didn't you? Yes, I did. I spent a week 250 kilometres north of the Arctic Circle where there were only a few hours of sunlight every day and the temperature was minus 30 degrees Celsius. Ooh. But it was a marvellous trip. What made it really exciting for me was the dogs. I went on a ride across the snow on a sled pulled by four dogs or huskies as they're called. They're amazing animals and I love getting them to obey my commands. You can shout left or right to them and they'll obey immediately. But what I found myself shouting more than anything was the word stop, <laughs> just to make sure they knew who was in control. And what was extraordinary about my huskies was that they obey these commands in more than one language. 
Obviously they understand Finnish, but my guide told me they'll respond to German too. If I'd been there longer, I'd have taught them some French, <laughs> just for the fun of it. <laughs> anyway, my guide and I set off on two dog sleds into the frozen Finnish countryside. To begin with, I was too preoccupied with controlling the dogs to admire the wonderful scenery. <laughs> Those huskies certainly love to run. Their tongues hang out, their noses strain forward, and their tails stream behind them. I didn't take my eyes off the lead dog. It had white ears, and if I looked at them, it helped me concentrate on where we were going. My lead dog was an exceptionally intelligent animal, though they always have to be smart. Apparently, they are also usually female. There are male dogs in the team too, but they don't take the lead position. As I said, my sled had four dogs, but you need eight or ten to pull a sled going with a full load of 200 kilos. Each individual dog is capable of hauling 30 kilos, and they seem to do it almost effortlessly. At first, we were dashing along in the open countryside, but after about an hour we turned into the forest. We disturbed a few birds and snow would come falling down out of the trees. But <laughs> branches were the things I really had to look out for. I certainly didn't want to get one in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we got to a cabin where we were going to have lunch. My guide started a fire and set about preparing a meal of reindeer meat, washed down with juice made from berries that grow in the forest. He sent me off with a bucket to fetch some water. This involved making a hole in the ice on a nearby lake. <laughs> I must say I was quite nervous that the ice was going to break underneath my weight. <laughs> that dog sled ride was the best part of my trip. But there are other exciting ways to get around on the ice and snow. Another way I tried was riding a skidoo. <laughs> It's a great favourite with those of us who love racing about without much purpose. <laughs> and some people compare a skidoo to a motorbike, but to my mind it feels much more like travelling on a speedboat. It's certainly faster than being pulled by dogs. <laughs> but for me, its big disadvantage is that it's very noisy. The sound of the engine destroys the peace of the countryside. But thanks to my skidoo, I was able to travel deep into the wilderness to spend the night in a cabin by a frozen lake. <sighs> I'll never forget the incredibly beautiful night sky I saw there. The advantage of skidoo riding is that you never have icy hands, however low the temperature falls. This is thanks to the vehicle's heated handlebars. <laughs> oh, I wish there was something similar for your feet. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like an interesting trip. Would you go back to Finland? Oh, definitely. Now you'll hear part two again. Jeremy, I know you've just come back from Finland and you had some interesting experiences with transport while you were there, didn't you? Yes, I did. I spent a week 250 kilometres north of the Arctic Circle where there were only a few hours of sunlight every day and the temperature was minus 30 degrees Celsius. <sighs> but it was a marvellous trip. What made it really exciting for me was the dogs. I went on a ride across the snow on a sled pulled by four dogs or huskies as they're called. They're amazing animals and I love getting them to obey my commands. You can shout left or right to them and they'll obey immediately. But what I found myself shouting more than anything was the word stop, <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure they knew who was in control. And what was extraordinary about my huskies was that they obey these commands in more than one language. Obviously they understand Finnish, but my guide told me they'll respond to German too. If I'd been there longer, I'd have taught them some French, <laughs> just for the fun of it. <laughs> anyway, my guide and I set off on two dog sleds into the frozen Finnish countryside. To begin with, I was too preoccupied with controlling the dogs to admire the wonderful scenery. <laughs> Those huskies certainly love to run. Their tongues hang out, their noses strain forward, and their tails stream behind them. I didn't take my eyes off the lead dog. It had white ears, and if I looked at them, it helped me concentrate on where we were going. My lead dog was an exceptionally intelligent animal, though they always have to be smart. Apparently, they are also usually female. There are male dogs in the team too, but they don't take the lead position. As I said, my sled had four dogs, but you need eight or ten to pull a sled going with a full load of 200 kilos. Each individual dog is capable of hauling 30 kilos, and they seem to do it almost effortlessly. At first, we were dashing along in the open countryside, 
but after about an hour we turned into the forest. We disturbed a few birds and snow would come falling down out of the trees. But <laughs> branches were the things I really had to look out for. I certainly didn't want to get one in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually we got to a cabin where we were going to have lunch. My guide started a fire and set about preparing a meal of reindeer meat, washed down with juice made from berries that grow in the forest. He sent me off with a bucket to fetch some water. This involved making a hole in the ice on a nearby lake. <laughs> I must say I was quite nervous that the ice was going to break underneath my weight. <laughs> that dog sled ride was the best part of my trip. But there are other exciting ways to get around on the ice and snow. Another way I tried was riding a skidoo. <laughs> It's a great favourite with those of us who love racing about without much purpose. <laughs> and some people compare a skidoo to a motorbike, but to my mind it feels much more like travelling on a speedboat. It's certainly faster than being pulled by dogs. <laughs> but for me, its big disadvantage is that it's very noisy. The sound of the engine destroys the peace of the countryside. But thanks to my skidoo, I was able to travel deep into the wilderness to spend the night in a cabin by a frozen lake. <sighs> I'll never forget the incredibly beautiful night sky I saw there. The advantage of skidoo riding is that you never have icy hands, however low the temperature falls. This is thanks to the vehicle's heated handlebars. <laughs> oh, I wish there was something similar for your feet. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like an interesting trip. Would you go back to Finland? Oh, definitely. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five different people talking about shopping for clothes. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to F what each speaker says. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1. I don't really do a lot of shopping. I've got more important things to do. And that's why I tend to go to a small boutique in the city centre. They sell the type of thing which suits me. I usually go if I want an outfit for a special occasion, and then I'll leave it until the last moment. I don't even try things on. The trousers, for example, I know will fit me perfectly. The price may be a bit of a shock, but it's not as if I do it every month, so I can afford it. I don't remember ever buying an item I didn't really need. Speaker 2 As I work in the fashion industry, you might think I'd have a wardrobe full of clothes. In fact, I'm very choosy. I'm surrounded by images of clothes all day long, so I'm able to decide what's just right for me. And we're always creating designs for the next season. So I can buy exactly what I need. I like to think I have the right thing for when the weather changes, rather than dashing into the shops at the last minute. I do spend a lot on my clothes, but I think it's worth investing in quality. The best styles don't go out of fashion. Speaker 3 Shopping is almost like a hobby for me, though my sister's always telling me I could be doing something more useful. I love it when winter's over I can start buying summer clothes. I try to concentrate on the essentials, but then, like the other day, I caught sight of a dress in a shop window when I was on the bus. I jumped off and walked back to get it, and it looked great when I tried it on, but I've never actually worn it, like a lot of things in my wardrobe. My friends think I waste money, but they just don't understand. Speaker 4 I've lived in jeans and t-shirts for years because it's easy, but when I got this new job I realised I'd have to face up to wearing a boring shirt, collar and tie to work. I was dreading it. I thought I'm going to have to spend all my salary increase on two new jackets. They cost a fortune. 
But when I got into town, a lot of the clothes shops had big reductions on everything. I never like to buy the first thing I see, though. I must have tried on about twenty jackets. I find it impossible to decide what looks best on me, so I usually rely on my girlfriend's advice. Speaker 5 I love looking through magazines to see all the latest fashions, but of course, the models in there are tall and slim, and with my figure I have to be very careful about what I buy. That's why, if I find a style that suits me, I sometimes buy it in several colours. My parents accuse me of being extravagant with clothes, but that's rubbish. When I get fed up with something, it's pointless keeping it. I don't like clothes that go on for years. I don't waste any time thinking about it. I sell them to a second-hand shop, which means I've got money to buy something new. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. I don't really do a lot of shopping. I've got more important things to do. And that's why I tend to go to a small boutique in the city centre. They sell the type of thing which suits me. I usually go if I want an outfit for a special occasion and then I'll leave it until the last moment. I don't even try things on. The trousers, for example, I know will fit me perfectly. The price may be a bit of a shock, but it's not as if I do it every month, so I can afford it. I don't remember ever buying an item I didn't really need. Speaker 2 As I work in the fashion industry, you might think I'd have a wardrobe full of clothes. In fact, I'm very choosy. I'm surrounded by images of clothes all day long, so I'm able to decide what's just right for me. And we're always creating designs for the next season. So I can buy exactly what I need. I like to think I have the right thing for when the weather changes, rather than dashing into the shops at the last minute. I do spend a lot on my clothes, but I think it's worth investing in quality. The best styles don't go out of fashion. Speaker 3 Shopping is almost like a hobby for me, though my sister's always telling me I could be doing something more useful. I love it when winter's over and I can start buying summer clothes. I try to concentrate on the essentials, but then, like the other day, I caught sight of a dress in a shop window when I was on the bus. I jumped off and walked back to get it, and it looked great when I tried it on, but I've never actually worn it, like a lot of things in my wardrobe. My friends think I waste money, but they just don't understand. Speaker 4 I've lived in jeans and t-shirts for years because it's easy, but when I got this new job I realised I'd have to face up to wearing a boring shirt, collar and tie to work. I was dreading it. I thought I'm going to have to spend all my salary increase on two new jackets. They cost a fortune. But when I got into town, a lot of the clothes shops had big reductions on everything. I never like to buy the first thing I see, though. I must have tried on about 20 jackets. I find it impossible to decide what looks best on me, so I usually rely on my girlfriend's advice. Speaker 5 I love looking through magazines to see all the latest fashions, but of course, the models in there are tall and slim, and with my figure I have to be very careful about what I buy. That's why, if I find a style that suits me, I sometimes buy it in several colours. My parents accuse me of being extravagant with clothes, but that's rubbish. When I get fed up with something, it's pointless keeping it. I don't like clothes that go on for years. I don't waste any time thinking about it. I sell them to a second-hand shop, which means I've got money to buy something new. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You'll hear part of an interview with the actor and film director, Charles Martin. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B or C. You now have one minute to look at part four.
My guest today is the actor and film director Charles Martin. Welcome, Charles. Mm. Mm. Now, let's start at the beginning. You played a part in the American TV series Cowboys for about six years. Well, that's right. I, I never dreamed I'd work steadily for six years and in the same part. Uh, that's unusual in the acting profession. Uh, I managed to save a little money during that time, uh, figuring I'd maybe get to a low period without work. But as it happened, something always turned up. It certainly did. You were discovered by the filmmaker Mario Oresti and mm -hmm. starred in some very popular films. What attracted you to the first one? Well, uh, Mario came up with this idea of uh, reinterpreting an ancient legend and setting it in 19th century Mexico, which uh, was quite adventurous in itself. And then, because of Mario's contacts, it was easier to make the movie in Spain. Uh, my part wasn't so different from my TV work, but the film had a definite Spanish flavor, uh, with all the local actors as well as guys from Italy. Um, very exotic for a young American guy. Now, your style of acting was very quiet, mm -hmm. almost silent. Did people understand what you were doing? Uh, uh, I think the producers were concerned initially. Um, I had this image of how my character, Miguel, should be, and... I persuaded them to cut a lot of dialogue from the original screenplay. Uh, <clears throat> in movies today, there are so many close-ups that you can do a lot without having to say much, if you know what I mean. Uh, unlike the old silent movies where actors felt obliged to overplay everything, mm. you know, perhaps they figured audiences wouldn't understand unless they used uh, exaggerated gestures and expressions. In your next big film, The Good Cop, mm. you played a very angry young man. Yeah. How much of that was acting? Well, <laughs> well, people suggested all sorts of reasons for my anger, which uh, I found rather surprising. Uh, I certainly have an ability to express anger. Um, it's part of my job. Uh, it was an exciting detective story which was making some relevant points, and it was a welcome change from what I'd been doing. Later, you turned to directing. Mm -hmm. Was that something you'd wanted to do for a long time? Yeah, but I had to wait for the right opportunity with the film just for a laugh. You got your friend, John Dawson, who'd directed you in several films, to act in just for a laugh. <laughs> was it because you were nervous about directing? Well, that was what everyone said. Um, what I felt, though, was that he'd become a better director if he had to be an actor. For a change, mm -hmm. just as I became a better actor by getting behind the camera. Mm. Uh, I used to joke with John that uh, if I got stuck when I was telling the actors what to do, he'd be there to help out. Mm. You're said to be a very dynamic and lively director. Where does that come from? Oh, I, I do what's necessary. If it's quick, that's fine. Um, if there are problems, then I'll stay until I get what I want. Um, Great actors will come loaded with ideas, and part of the joy of shooting a movie is seeing how they do it. Um, it's like conducting an orchestra. Um, the first time you hear the music that you've just seen as notes on a page, uh, some sections surprise you. Everyone's surprised that your movies are completed on time and within budget. How do you do it? Well, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've been around a lot of movie sets as an actor where so much time was wasted from having to repeat scenes so many times. My way is everybody comes prepared with their lines learnt and they know there will only be one or two takes of a scene, not 15 or 20. That way they remember how they acted, so that leads on smoothly to the next section. That gives everyone in front of and behind the cameras uh, more belief in the project. They work hard, but they have more time for themselves. So what's next for you? Now you'll hear part four again. My guest today is the actor and film director Charles Martin. Welcome, Charles. Mm. Mm. Now, let's start at the beginning. You played a part in the American TV series Cowboys for about six years. Well, that's right. I, I never dreamed I'd work steadily for six years and in the same part. Uh, that's unusual in the acting profession. Uh, I managed to save a little money during that time, uh, figuring I'd maybe get to a low period without work. But as it happened, something always turned up. It certainly did. You were discovered by the filmmaker Mario Oresti and mm -hmm. starred in some very popular films. What attracted you to the first one? 
Well, uh, Mario came up with this idea of uh, reinterpreting an ancient legend and setting it in 19th century Mexico, which uh, was quite adventurous in itself. And then, because of Mario's contacts, it was easier to make the movie in Spain. Uh, my part wasn't so different from my TV work, but the film had a definite Spanish flavor, uh, with all the local actors as well as guys from Italy. Um, very exotic for a young American guy. Now, your style of acting was very quiet, mm -hmm. almost silent. Did people understand what you were doing? Uh, uh, I think the producers were concerned initially. Um, I had this image of how my character, Miguel, should be, and I persuaded them to cut a lot of dialogue from the original screenplay. Uh, <clears throat> in movies today, there are so many close-ups that you can do a lot without having to say much. If you know what I mean, uh, unlike the old silent movies where actors felt obliged to overplay everything, mm. you know, perhaps they figured audiences wouldn't understand unless they used uh, exaggerated gestures and expressions. In your next big film, The Good Cop, mm. you played a very angry young man. Yeah. How much of that was acting? Well, <laughs> well, people suggested all sorts of reasons for my anger, which uh, I found rather surprising. Uh, I certainly have an ability to express anger. Um, it's part of my job. Uh, it was an exciting detective story which was making some relevant points and it was a welcome change from what I'd been doing. Later, you turned to directing. Mm -hmm. Was that something you'd wanted to do for a long time? Yeah, but I had to wait for the right opportunity with the film just for a laugh. You got your friend, John Dawson, who'd directed you in several films, to act in Just for a Laugh. <laughs> was it because you were nervous about directing? Well, that was what everyone said. Um, what I felt, though, was that he'd become a better director if he had to be an actor for a change, mm -hmm. just as I became a better actor by getting behind the camera. Mm. Uh, I used to joke with John that uh, if I got stuck when I was telling the actors what to do, he'd be there to help out. <laughs> You're said to be a very dynamic and lively director. Where does that come from? Oh, I, I do what's necessary. If it's quick, that's fine. Um, if there are problems, then I'll stay until I get what I want. Uh, great actors will come loaded with ideas, and part of the joy of shooting a movie is seeing how they do it. Um, it's like conducting an orchestra. Um, the first time you hear the music that you've just seen as notes on a page, uh, some sections surprise you. Everyone's surprised that your movies are completed on time and within budget. How do you do it? Well, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've been around a lot of movie sets as an actor where so much time was wasted from having to repeat scenes so many times. My way is everybody comes prepared with their lines learnt and they know there will only be one or two takes of a scene, not 15 or 20. That way they remember how they acted, so that leads on smoothly to the next section. That gives everyone in front of and behind the cameras uh, more belief in the project. They work hard, but they have more time for themselves. So what's next for you? That's the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time.